Somebody needs to mute. Everybody should be muted. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live on Facebook. We're going to give it just a couple minutes for folks to get online and be ready to go. Thank you for joining us here with the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. We are thrilled you are with us. It's going to be a great evening. We've got all the Democratic candidates from the 1st Congressional District and a lot of great women leaders who are leading the Democratic Party of New Mexico. So we're thrilled you're with us. We're going to give it just a minute. It's exactly six o'clock. We are thrilled you are joining us this evening. It is going to be quite a night. So sit back, grab your beverage of choice, your bag of popcorn, and let's get ready to go. Uh, thank you for joining us. Look at all these beautiful people that have joined us tonight. Everybody wave to our to our folks out on the internet. Look at that. Look at that. Look at all these fantastic smiles. Look at the million dollar smiles. If we could cash these in for campaign contributions, you all could retire it all right now. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We're thrilled you're here. We're going to give it just one more minute. We'll start right at 6.02 tonight here with the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women who are bringing this incredible forum to you. Let me just say that when the Democratic women call, candidates say yes. And that's exactly what happened tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We've got every single one of the Democratic candidates who've agreed to join us on this fantastic forum brought to you by the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. Good evening, Chris Salas, Steffi Mack, Dr. Lawrence Royball, Steve Benavides. We are so glad to see all of you. Carlos Caballero, Agustin Montoya, Marcela Antoinette, Georgina, we're so glad you're here. Zoe, thank you for being with us tonight. It is going to be a great, great evening. We've got lots of folks tuning in live here on Facebook. It is now 6.02, and we're going to get this party started, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me just remind everybody that has joined us uh, here on this Zoom call, we're going to ask you to stay muted until I call your name, and then you're going to unmute, and then you're going to remute when you finish uh, the questions and answers and introductions and closings so that we can make sure that everybody out there on Facebook gets to see the maximum opportunity to see those million dollar smiles all night long. So look, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, we are here to talk about the future of the first congressional district here in the beautiful land of enchantment, the Tierra del Encanto, the 47th star on that beautiful flag of our United States of America. This evening is brought to you by the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. They have a strong vision of electing democratic leaders at every level of government, whether it's the county, state, or national level, they're working hard for the future of our country. Their mission is to unite women of the Democratic Party of New Mexico and to fully participate in every level of Democratic Party politics. And they've brought this vision to you tonight and we're so glad you're able to join us so let me tell you uh, i'm going to put it in the chat uh, but somebody else can put it there for me if you're watching tonight on facebook i want you to encourage your friends to join the new mexico federation of democratic women they do amazing work and we know that when democratic women get involved democrats win so let's make sure we join that federation and you can do that at www.nmfdw Dot com. That's nmfdw.com, New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women.com. So look, let me give you the ground rules tonight. Each candidate tonight is going to have two minutes to introduce themselves to you. That's two minutes for introductions. I'm going to then introduce some panelists. They're going to ask a series of five questions. Everything tonight is two minutes. We're keeping it easy on our candidates. They are working so hard. I know that they just finished a forum and now they're back again to answer your questions because they understand the gravity of what's going to take place in the weeks to come. It is a big deal and we're glad you're here. So panelists are going to uh, be introduced. They're going to ask their designated question. The candidates will each have two minutes to answer those. After we get through all five of those questions, we're going to go to closing comments and we're going to reverse the order from opening comments and they'll have two minutes to close. Two minutes to open, two minutes per question, two minutes to close. I'm going to bring everybody to camera to see if we can get a thumbs up here to make sure everybody's on board with those rules. Are we good? All right, we got thumbs up. That means I'm clear for the first time ever. Uh, let me just say, uh, we are now at 6.04. You will hear an alarm go off at two minutes. I'm going to ask each of our candidates to be as respectful as they possibly can to wrap up whatever that, that sentence. I can't have you wrap up your thoughts. 
because we'll be here all night. I need you to wrap up your sentence and then get on to the next candidate. Is that fair for everybody? Thumbs up. All right. Again, we want to welcome everybody to this event brought to you by the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. So thank you. The Honorable Linda Stover is with us tonight watching. She's sitting up straight. She's got her beverage of choice and a bag of popcorn. She's at it. So let's get started. We're going to start with opening comments and the opening introductions from each of these candidates. We're going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, we're going to start with the Honorable Patricia Roybal Caballero. So I'm going to ask her to unmute and I'm going to have her tell us a little bit about herself. Thank you. As a lifelong labor and community organizer, I'm proud to be a party activist for over 50 years. And you've seen me in action over the years with you all. I think I can say I've been the most active state legislator in our Democratic Party. I've increased voter turnout in my district, at least by double digits since being elected in 2020 and 2012. Women comprise the most voters, and my focus has been to relate my living experiences with women and assure them that I will represent them. As a single mom, I had to work in the day, go to school at night, and after school, I worked cleaning hair salons. I couldn't get sick because neither job had paid sick leave, and both jobs paid minimum wage, barely enough to live on. This is why I fought so hard for paid sick leave, which I'm proud to note the bill has now passed. As an indigenous woman and tribal member, I was taught to value clean air, water, and land as gifts from Mother Earth. I will continue to work to lead towards clean, renewable energy. And I'm also happy to note that after many sessions, I and the team were able to pass the Community Solar Act this session. The pandemic has hit women of color the hardest. In Congress, I will continue to fight for a $15 an hour wage and for all policy that uplifts our women and families out of cycles of poverty to cycles of opportunity. I will make sure we track the impact of remote learning because this is both an economic priority and equity issue. I served as Democratic Caucus Chair, leading our caucus to retake our Democratic majority in 2016. Being blue for me goes from my heart to hard work in action. The work needed to be done in Congress isn't glamorous, it's work, it's organizing, and no one knows how to do that better than me. I'm ready to do the hard work. I've done it all my life. I hope you agree and will help me get to the finish line. Gracias. You are right on the money. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Patricia Roybal Caballero. Now we're going to go to Mr. Francisco Fernandez. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you so much to the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. I appreciate you for organizing this event and moving the date so that we could participate this evening. So a lot of you are meeting me for the first time, and that's probably because several months ago I had no idea I'd be running for Congress. Um, after all, I'm an everyday, hardworking New Mexican with a background in TV production, not politics. <clears throat> Don't call Francisco. Familiar. Francisco, yes, sir. I hate to interrupt you. I'm going to ask you to turn on your camera if that's at all possible. There there yes, is that better? There we Much go. Better. Thank you. <laughs> so when COVID put millions out of a job, I was spared working from home as a call center agent by day and writing a television pilot by night. On Christmas morning, members of our community and I shared our excitement at Deb Holland's historic opportunity. We were thrilled for her to continue breaking barriers, leading the Department of the Interior. And then we realized that evening, who would serve as our voice in Congress now? So when a close friend of mine turned to me and said, you should run. Me, I questioned, said, yes, you. You have a servant's heart. You've lived, in our You've lived our community struggles and successes and you use your voice in TV. Why not in government? Others agreed and it threw me off guard. Um, you see, coming from a working class or as a working class gay Chicano growing up in neighborhoods like Westgate and Barelas, we're just not used to being encouraged to pursue the impossible. So still I could not shake their heads from my head or their words from my head. Uh, that night while finishing an episode of Breaking Bad, I saw my name in the credits and it hit me. Despite my challenges, I've lived some of my dreams while supporting others along the way. I've always championed marginalized communities like my own and built coalitions. I secured health coverage for employees when greedy Hollywood studios failed to do so. I ushered in diverse voices to an industry that denied us a seat at the table for too long. So now I stand before you as a candidate because those folks were right. It's time I use my voice in Congress to champion everyday New Mexicans and ensure that we all have a fair shot at the American promise. You see, I'm proud to be a native New Mexican. I love our blended people rooted in culture, tradition, and resilience, where hardworking families like mine build our communities. We are first responders, educators, and small business owners. We're also the working poor, the shelterless, struggling with pre-existing conditions, addiction, and mental health illness. 
But I look out for all of us and Mother Earth because achieving the American promise requires more than hard work. It requires support and compassion from each Thank other and from a there, government that Francisco. invests in people and our planet. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Francisco. And then we have community activist Celinda Guerrero. Celinda, take it away. Thank you so much for this space tonight and this great conversation. I am here today as my whole self, Celinda Guerrero. I am a mother. I am a grandmother. I'm an Afro-Chicana, Indigenous, queer, Black feminist. I am also a phenomenal community organizer, and I am proud to be every bit of all of these identities. This is an amazing opportunity we have right now to bring the voices of the working poor and those most affected by the pandemic to the decision-making table. I have faced many of the same conditions that impacted my, many in my community. I was, once, I was one of the first ones evicted this summer despite there being a moratorium. My partner Clifton White has also became imprisoned because of our work for Black Lives. I am a community healer. My values are to lead with love and to stand in my courage. These ingrained values are integral to holding me accountable as we move our important work in Congress. I am deeply connected to my district and I see my run for office as our run for office. We already have a lot of lawyers and corporate class representation in Congress but democracy works when all of our voices are represented. Our people said that they need free health care, they need coverage, they need free education and the removal of student debt, free transportation because we know unemployment drops when we have access, affordable housing and sustainable union jobs, a viable path to citizenship, freedom from state violence, and most of all, a respect for our humanity and a right to self-determination. We can do all of this by caring for our animals, earth, land, air, and most of all, our water. That is what we are here to do. We're here to protect and to build. We are the people for Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celinda Guerrero. Now we'll go right over to our state senator, the Honorable Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, my family goes back in the state for 13 generations, but it's not just that. I also have many immigrants who have uh, in the family tree and we would have lost our language. We would have lost our culture without that constant infusion of, of immigrants into our state. Um, I graduated from Belen, I was born here in Albuquerque, but I graduated from Belen High in, in uh, Valencia County where I was raised in Los Chavez. I went to UNM and then I went to UCLA Law School I then clerked for the DC circuit at the time that R Ruth Bader Ginsburg was there. I then came home. I raised my three children here in the, in the same uh, house um, that we've uh, lived in for 33 years. Um, and I also um, spent 27 years at the law school. After that, I felt a very strong pull to community. So I left the law school and I ran a domestic violence agency that served all, of course, but our target outreach was Latino immigrants. I was then recruited to run for Congress after uh, Trump was selected by the Electoral College. I ran for Congress two years ago and the best person won, but I loved running and I had the opportunity to become a state Senator and I have loved governing. So now I'm running again. I didn't think I'd have the opportunity to do it, especially not so soon. And I am really looking forward to this. Um, in addition to everything I offered last time, I now offer two years of experience in the state Senate. So thank you. Um, I look forward to this debate. Thank you, Senator Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And now we go to the Honorable Representative Georgine Lewis. Representative Lewis. Kawatsi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Georgine Lewis. I'm a proud member of the Pueblo of Acoma. I was raised with three core values, culture, clans, and community. Culture means we pray for one another, for everyone's prosperity, safety, and well-being. Clans is best represented by family. No one is ever alone or without support. Last but certainly not least is community. Community reminds us that we're not just individuals. We share our heartaches, our challenges, and our successes. All of those are felt together. So I credit my successes to those three core values. 
I'm now a lawyer for a sovereign nation and I'm a five term state legislator and chairwoman of the state government elections and Indian affairs committee. I work every day in these roles to deliver for New Mexicans and I have not, um, I have not changed within those core values. So protection of our mother earth has always been extremely important. So representation matters. I'm running for Congress to build off the fantastic work that Deb Holland started, including fighting tirelessly to re represent our tribal communities. I promise to build off the work that she began and then just continue that fight down the road. I'm really looking forward to help New Mexico recover and build back stronger than ever after this devastating pandemic, fight to expand healthcare access for all New Mexicans, protect our mother earth and our environment, and of course, defend the rights of all women. So I'll continue this fight because I know New Mexico deserves a brighter future. Um, look for our information on the website, georgine4nm.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Georgine Lewis. And now we go to Distinguished Attorney Randy McGinn. Thank you, Brian. It is so nice to be among friends uh, for this uh, forum, and thanks for having it. Um, those of you who know me know me as um, a lawyer for the past 40 years who's fought for women's rights and against discrimination and sexual violence of women, um, including most recently having organized 40 lawyers um, to, to volunteer to prosecute all the rapists they found when Tim Keller got a grant to test the 5,000 rape kits that had been sitting on a shelf for a decade. When I represent women in rape cases, one of the questions I always ask in the jury pool is I draw a line up on a chart and I ask the same question of men and the same, then the same question of women. And the question I ask is, what do you do as a man on a daily basis to keep from being raped? And after a lot of thinking, this side of the page is always blank. And when I ask the same question of the women jurors, what do you do on a daily basis to keep from being raped? Line after line after line. I, I park my car in a lighted space. I make sure I know who's walking around me. I never run with my headphones on and on and on. And I carry my keys like with, 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 through my fingers to be safe. And that tells you about the, 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 how it's different for women than men in our world. And our sisters in Atlanta certainly know that. Um, all of those women who were killed uh, by male violence and, and, and accusing them even of of, of inciting him, uh, that is wrong. Um, and that is the kind of thing we need to fight against. I thank goodness that Congress passed in the last four days, the Violence Against Women Act, and now we have to get that through Congress to protect women from those kinds of things. I wanna go to Congress to fight for all the things we believe in, to transform government so it works for the people and not for, for corporations again. Are we almost done? Five minutes, five seconds, Brian? To pass universal health care, rebuild our economy and infrastructure, pay a $15 minimum wage, protect the vote, and very, heal the planet. Thank you very, very much. Randy. Okay, thanks, Brian. Okay. You, you bet. We'll Thank more. you. And, and now we go to civil servant activist, Mr. Victor Reyes. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, for having me here today. As the son of a single mother and the brother of two sisters, I'm so honored to be here, and I know that I stand on the shoulders of so many great women who made it possible for me to be here today. You know, we have a difficult decision as, as a party in this election, one that will have great impacts. And while there's so many great options, what sets me apart is that, you know, even though my name hasn't been the one on press releases, even though I haven't been the one in front of the cameras, when it comes time to roll up their sleeves and get the work done, that's where I've been delivering for our families across the state. When the minimum wage was stalled in the New Mexico legislature, when members of our own party were standing in its way, I brought people back to the table to ensure that we were acting to raise the minimum wage and give people a raise then, not later. When we were looking at making bold transformational investments in the early childhood and care sector, I helped ensure that the early childhood and care department was set up in our state, that we passed that legislation and that we created new revenue streams to ensure that we were making these investments we know will be transformational. When Congress couldn't act 
and our families were demanding relief during a surging pandemic, I put together and orchestrated a special session to deliver immediate relief for our families and our small businesses, twice what Congress was able to during that time. We deserve a change maker in this seat. And when the legislators, when the lawyers, when the advocates can't get it all the way across the finish line, that's when I come in. That's when I've been called to serve. And I'm so honored to have been able to do that. We have an opportunity to be transformational on our selection. We need a progressive fighter, just like our Congresswoman Deb Holland, who is willing to take on the great fights and deliver on them. Because it's not enough just to vote the right way. We need to have someone who has proven that they can get the work done. We don't need someone who can send a press release. We don't need someone who can be flashy. We need someone that can make sure that we are breaking down barriers that hold our families back. I'm excited to be in this race and to be to be have the opportunity to serve as the youngest member of Congress in the Democratic Caucus, the first LGBTQ member from New Mexico, and this type of representation is critical. We have an opportunity to make sure entire voices and generations are reflected. I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Victor Reyes. And now we go to the Honorable Representative Melody Stansberry. All right, well, thank you to our State Auditor Colon and the amazing women of the uh, New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, and also to our amazing other candidates who have been traveling this journey together. It's really an honor to be able to be on this path with you. So I am Melanie Stansbury, and I am running for Congress for the same reason that I ran for the New Mexico State House. And that is because I believe deeply in our people and our ability to bring meaningful change to our communities. I grew up right here in Albuquerque. I went to Albuquerque Public Schools, K through 12, graduated from Cibola High School, grew up in the North Valley and the West Side. I grew up busing tables, doing landscaping, helping my mom with sewing projects. And I know what it's like to struggle to make ends meet. And I know the work that we have to do to build our communities and bring change. And that is why I've spent my entire life working at the nexus between science, sustainability, and social justice. I've worked as a STEM educator and a professional working on water and land rights across our state. I worked in Washington, D.C. for nearly seven years, working during the Obama administration in the White House Office of Management and Budget and in the United States Senate, where I worked in the committee that Deb was confirmed in just a couple of weeks ago. And I serve in the New Mexico State Legislature, where I have championed addressing issues like hunger, homelessness, climate change, and water resilience. It's that lifetime of experience that I will take back to Washington to fight for our people, to lift up our voices and to bring meaningful change. The moment that we are living in doesn't require just a good representative. It requires fundamental change in our politics and how we lift up our people. And to do that, we have to elect somebody who knows New Mexico, who knows DC, who knows the science and will fight every single day for New Mexico. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you, Representative Melanie Stansbury. So look, let me just take a quick minute here. Uh, I, I failed to introduce myself. My name is Brian Colon. I'm getting text messages that says people don't know who you are. And I said, well, let me just say I'm honored to be serving for about 811 days as your state auditor of New Mexico. They've all been awesome. I have been really honored to know each and every one of these eight fantastic candidates. And as you see, you've got a tough choice ahead of you. On March 30th, we will make the decision as to who our nominee will be from the Democratic Party of New Mexico. And then on June 1st, the people of Congressional District 1 will determine who will fill the vacancy created by the ever trailblazing and historic leader from New Mexico, the incredible Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland. So that's what's gonna happen here uh, over the next 60 days or so. And folks, you're watching History in Action and they've just met eight fantastic civil and public servants of New Mexico. And we're gonna get it done. Now look, we're gonna shift now over to our great questions that have been prepared by the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. And we've got all the leaders here with us tonight. We're gonna start with the leader and president of the Bernalillo County Federation of Democratic Women, Ms. Dorothy Temmer. Dorothy is a tireless advocate for democratic values and New Mexicans. She works in the legislature every year. She's got a smile for everyone, and we're so pleased that she is the president of the Burnco Fed of Democratic Women. Dorothy, take it away. 
Thank you, Brian. And congratulations to all of you for putting your hand in the race. I, there's a lot of experience here and I'm really excited. I think uh, we would win with pretty much all of you. Okay, pandemic related gender and racial disparities. According to a study by the National Women's Law Center, the impact of the COVID pandemic has been brutal for working women and catastrophic for women of color. In 2020, the unemployment rates for the adult Latina and black women age 20 and over was 9.1% and 8.4% compared to adult white male unemployment rate of 5.8%. Since February, 2020, women have lost a net 5.4 million jobs or 55% of the more than 9.8 million um, US jobs that have been lost because of COVID. Meanwhile, the crippling, excuse me, the crippling burden of childcare and remote learning has been has fallen much more heavily to mothers. We are in danger of widening gender and racial wage gaps that has huge impacts for the fi financial security of women and of the families who are depending on women. The question is. If elected, what will you do to address COVID-related gender and racial disparities? Thank you, Thank you, President Dorothy Temer. We're gonna start this question. You've got two minutes. Everything tonight is two minutes, so it's easy to remember. We're gonna start with Francisco Fernandez. Thank you, Dorothy. So you are right, and those statistics are incredibly abysmal. Um, it's no secret that women have always been mistreated and disregarded in our country. It's, unfortunately part of our history and something that we all need to work towards uh, bettering. I've seen it with the women in my life, such as my, my mother, uh, who's been struggling with her own pre-existing conditions, and my grandmother, who spent more than enough time uh, working in janitorial services, cleaning up after others. I'm proud to say that on Wednesday of last week that the House did pass the Equal Rights Amendment, and we just have to work, hope that the Senate will take that a step further. Um, in terms of closing the gap, I think that one of the best ways we can do that is something that has not even been brought upon uh, in terms of legislation. That would be a universal basic income. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about this during the 60s as a way to close the, the racial gap. I think it'll also serve to help close the gender gap. What we know is that when people are provided with a universal basic income, they have the opportunity to either reach out and take other opportunities that, that might be in a better job, a better sense for education, they're able to take time off to be with those uh, that may need them most. Um, I look at my mother who serves as a caretaker. Uh, for her, for instance, her being able to have at least some type of income in that regard would be so much more helpful. And um, we also have to look out for the fact that there are so many women who are uh, survivors of domestic violence, right? We need to make sure that the house also passes the, or uh, I guess actually just renewed the Violence of, of Women uh, Against Women Act, as I mentioned before. Um, but what we need to do is make sure that that is taken a step further, that the folks are guaranteed those protections, that folks are prosecuted for any types of acts that they commit. Um, additionally, I think we also need to look towards healthcare. Healthcare is a means that we know has seen too much discrimination, quite frankly. When I look at living with HIV, for instance, Black women are the one demographic where this virus tends to target or, or increase the fastest and the highest. We know that it's because there is discrimination in medicine, uh, in all levels, and we need to address that as well. How we do that, I think, is going to be coming together as a coalition to make sure that we pass acts that hold folks accountable when they're discriminating, that hold employers accountable, uh, as well as make sure that we all look out for one another in terms of just having compassion for one another. That means out on the House floor and here in person. Um, I hope that addresses your question, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Fernandez. And next, we'll go to the same question for Selena Guerrero. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this question. As somebody who is an Afro-Latina and um, has had many of the experiences that, uh, that are being discussed, I'm a mama of six phenomenal young people. And many of those times that I was um, pregnant, I didn't have access to maternity leave. I didn't have access um, to support. When, and often I went back to work with one of my children just after four weeks after giving birth because I was about to be evicted from my apartment because we did not have sustainable resources to support working mamas of color. 
So my priorities are very, this is very close to my heart. And I also am somebody who has had to sue under the Equal Pay Act, an employer for discriminatory practices where I was making $5 an hour less than the men that I was, that were working alongside me. So these are issues that are very close to my heart. I know that we have to um, create access to livable wages across the board and, and employment structures that respects our workers, gives paid sick leave and paternal leave, disability leave. Um, we need access to technical training and university and colleges. It has to be free and accessible and attainable. These benefits have to be included for all workers, especially those that are typically um, excluded that are dominated by women like tipped workers and uh, domestic workers. We must extend collective bar extend collective bargaining and the right to unionize. And, um, and, and we have to end at will employment. Um, this is dangerous for communities like mine. We have to build a strong families infrastructure package by investing in the caregiving economy, public education, paid leave and universal childcare by providing equal pay, livable wages and benefits to childcare, public education and domestic workers. We believe that there is enough for everybody. We know that we can build these sustainable futures for us all. Thank you very much, Selena Guerrero. Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Antoinette Cedillo Lopez, go right ahead. Thank you. I don't know if somebody was trying to unmute me, but it kept going back and forth between mute and unmuted. Um, thank you. That is such an important question, Dorothy, and I'm so glad that you asked it because women of color have been raising this issue for a long time. And it is exactly what you said. COVID has really showed it for everyone to see. Um, and you can't ignore it now. There are so many things we need to do. Uh, paid family leave, for one thing, would make, make very would be very important. I was so proud that we were able to, to pass paid sick leave um, in the legislature this year. That was just so important. And that is an important step. Um, closing the gender wage gap is something that we, that just pass, passing a simple equal, weak equal pay act has not been enough. So we need to do more. Childcare, we need to have more support for childcare for working families and specifically for women. Um, the Family Act, which would provide for paid time off for up to 12 weeks for women um, should be passed. We should talk about pregnancy discrimination. Um, there, you know, we do have a pregnancy discrimination act and I've written about that. And again, it's not enough. Why are these, these laws not enough for women of color? Because women of color face unique problems that white women don't. And what happens is, and I actually have a poem about this. You cannot see privilege unless you, um, you only notice privilege when you don't have it, I guess, is, is the point that I wanna make. And so I think it's really important for women of color to be at the table. Who was it that said, when women of color aren't at the table, they're for what's, di they're what's for dinner? So thank you for, an uh, uh, for answering that or asking that question. It's very important and something that I take very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Now we're gonna go to Georgine Lewis. Thank you for not the question only, but also for providing the statistics too, because I think a lot of times we don't remember or we don't recognize that women of color face disparities all the time. And um, I was a single mom. I had my daughter when I was a sophomore in high school. And I have experienced these financial insecurities, these stereotypes, these um, challenges because of the color of my skin. And especially now with this pandemic, we need to ensure that things like this stop. Um, I come from a tribe that traditionally reser reserves leadership roles for women. And this has taught me to look through a different lens, not a right or a wrong lens, but a different lens. That's my lens. And I think I bring that to all of the discussions when um, we're talking about what's happening, what decisions are we making, what outcomes are we looking for, how do we move women, people of color, our tribes, 
and everyone um, together so we can address these important issues. As a, a female Native American, you know, I think that not only do we need to have opportunities for jobs, for education, for um, healthcare, but we need to ensure basic things like clean water and wastewater is available. We're seeing this in New Mexico in 2021 when we're dealing with a pandemic that we have some tribal communities that don't have access to clean water. So representation matters. We need to ensure that someone is knowledgeable on the issues about what it feels like to live in poverty, what it feels like for our families to live in poverty and ensure that these discussions are brought to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine Lewis. And now to Randy McGinn. Thanks, Brian. And thank you for the question. You know, the world expects women to carry the whole world on their shoulders. And, and all of us who have kids have been there, right? Where, where you're having to juggle your job and your child um, and your spouse, um, and who always, we're always feeling like we're shorting somebody and we're always feeling guilty. And in fact, the person that we short the most is us. And somebody once asked me, how, how can you as a woman have it all? And I said, well, you, you can't unless you wanna get no sleep. And that's the, that's the life of all women with children. And, it's, and this pandemic has shown how broken that system is. And so, so what we need um, is to pass the Thrive Act, which was proposed in the 2021 legislature by Deb Holland, which not only provides for women and children and, and childcare, but says that 40% of all of the resources from that act should go to women of color on whom the burden falls even, even harder. And, and in addition to that, I think we need something dramatic like what was done um, after the Great Depression, the, the civilian um, core that was created because all the men were out of jobs and young men got, they created all these jobs for men. Now, after the pandemic, we need something radical like that to help create jobs for women and to create good paying jobs and not just raise the $15 minimum wage, but to raise the $2.13 sub minimum wage, which are for waitresses and people who work in the restaurants for whom are mostly women and women of color. And so we have to do both those things. And those are the bold things I try to do for women in Congress. Thank you, Randy McGinn. And now we'll go to Victor Reyes. You know, serving on the front lines of the pandemic response, it was clear who was bearing the weight of these injustices. It was women, it was women of color, it was our families and communities of color. And that's why when I worked to pass the, during the special session, a comprehensive package that made sure that every single New Mexican on unemployment received $1,200 before the holiday season. It was because I knew that, that there were the faces of women who were going to benefit. When we looked to raise the minimum wage in 2019, we did it knowing that women are the, some of the primary earners of minimum wage or of minimum wage. We need to make sure that in Congress, we are fighting for women in every single sector when we're talking about economic justice. That means fighting to raise the minimum wage and, and provide a system where we can make sure that everybody has a living wage, that no mother has to choose between putting food on the table or paying their light bills. But we also shouldn't make them choose between putting food on their table and looking after their children. We live in a state where quality childcare costs more than what tuition at the University of New Mexico costs. And there's no federal assistance when it comes to providing for childcare. We need to make sure that it is universal and that it is accessible and create the network to make that a possibility. We need to make sure that we are passing a national paid sick leave, ensuring that nobody who is sick, nobody who is facing symptoms has to go into work. We need to make sure that we are looking and providing paid family medical leave so that we are, we are showing our commitment to our families and to generations of women to come. We need to make it clear that women are our frontline workers in every single sector and make sure that that commitment rings true in everything we do, every single package of legislation. That is our responsibility. And when it comes to getting that work done, that is something that I've always loved to do. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Reyes. And now we'll go to Melanie Stansbury. 
Thank you, Mr. Colon. Um, and thank you, Dorothy, for sharing the statistics. I think it's clear that the pandemic has laid bare inequalities in race, gender, and economic inequality, and that women and people all across the gender spectrum, and including and especially transgender women, have shouldered the brunt of this pandemic. And so how do we address these issues? We really have to address them from multiple angles. There's the immediate issues. How do we bring relief to families? How do we ensure that they have income, unemployment, um, access to childcare, um, that they have access to food? These are the immediate things that have to be included in a relief and recovery package. We have to address the structural issues that affect all women, fair wages, pay, pay equity, a $15 minimum wage, paid sick leave, Medicare for all, equity in education. Um, but we have to address these structural inequalities that also um, happen for women of color. And that means addressing directly economic prosperity for women of color, ensuring that we are providing opportunities for people to build businesses, to lead, to grow, to be able to um, prosper in all environments. And we have to bring institutional change to our institutions. And the final thing that I'll say is that when women lead, women win. And that is why we need women elected to Congress. We need women elected to leadership positions within Congress. And we need women leading across all of our organizations and institutions, because the only one who's going to bring change is by having women representing ourselves in leadership roles. Thank you, Melanie Stansbury. Patricia Roybal Caballero. Gracias, and thank you, Dorothy, for the statistics and data. I will tell you that when uh, the pandemic broke, I spent a lot of time on the phone calling my constituents, and most of them were terrified women, single women, uh, mothers caught at home, terrified that one, they were told they could not go back to work, uh, those that could keep one job, and some of them were working two jobs, were couldn't do it because they didn't have childcare and they didn't know what to do. And what the pandemic had did when I was speaking to these women was to, reminded me of my conversations with my mother about the depression and World War II. And my, my mother was a rosy riveter. She was brought back to help recover the economy. And she talked about how important it was to learn a new skill, get her out of the house and be able to move into uh, putting parts into airplanes and whatever else Rosie Riveters were doing um, <clears throat> during the war. So economic recovery has to be tied in with financial assistance, with childcare, and looking at subsidizing childcare. We've got to go and, and equip our uh, women also with child development uh, curriculum so that they feel also that they're contributing to their children's education and curriculum as well. I think we need to look at uh, looking at free education. Uh, in order for a COVID recovery, we need to look at our educational models and see about freeing uh, education. And we need to, of course, look at uh, instituting across the board and states have to exemplify paid family and medical leave. And I think also using the union model of apprenticeship uh, also would get women into the, the jobs and careers of their choice, whether that's technology, whether that's the trades, and yes, women want to go into the trades. So I would look at all of those aspects because we need long-term sustainable economic recovery. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Roybal Caballero. And now we're going to move to the second question. And I'm going to encourage our folks, you've got about 125 to 150 people watching live on Facebook right now for the future of the first congressional district. And I'm gonna encourage our viewers to share this post right now. We've got four more great questions in store for you and some great closing remarks by these phenomenal, phenomenal candidates. But for question number two, we're gonna to look to the president of the Sandoval County Democratic Women. That's the Sandoval Federation of Democratic Women led by Deb Dapson. Deb, take it away. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, candidates. I'm, I uh, share Dorothy's thoughts about you guys. I think any one of you would be great. In 2019, the U.S. House of Representatives voted to reauthorize the Violence Against Women's Act, as known as VAWA, but the reauthorization did not pass the Republican-controlled Senate. This year, as we just heard, 
the House Democrats again passed the reauthorization. Can you tell us your understanding of this legislation, why it is important, and how you would support it if elected to Congress? Thank you, President Dabson. We're going to start with Celinda Guerrero. Thank you so much for this really important question. As somebody who is a feminist and works um, in women's rights all the time in reproductive justice, um, we definitely understand that there is a need um, to protect our women at all in all of the different places. Um, and I also want to just um, lift up our missing, murdered, and indigenous women as well, um, because there's not enough conversation there either, and this needs to be included in all legislation as we're advancing the protection of women, um, women and people of, and all of our non-men and people of color. So I am completely behind this bill. I think it's very important. Um, it's long past due. We haven't done enough yet um, to be able to protect women um, in, in all of the ways. And we need to provide and flood resources back to women who are in the struggle and who are needing support right now. We don't, we don't yet provide resources for women who are having to escape violence, um, including um, our undocumented women um, who are at the highest rates and this legislation must include them as well. And so I think that there's ways and, um, and conversation that we need to do to advance these initiatives and grow them. And we have to be bold and courageous and unwavering as we're advancing this legislation. Um, I think that there's lots of opportunity here for us to be strong and bring those resources back to those who need it the very most. Thank you, Celinda Guerrero. Now to, and let me just say this, we're leaving off all the honorifics, except when I introduce you for your opening remarks and your closing remarks. So no disrespect intended to any elected officials or incredible folks that are uh, here as candidates, but we're leaving off the honorifics, except for opening and closing remarks. And with that, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And Antoinette, you are there, the thank sole you. Thank controller. you, I'm trying to unmute myself again. Um, yeah, that is the 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 reauthorization of VAWA is really important, especially for sexual assault, domestic violence. Does somebody is somebody off mute? Is somebody off mute? <laughs> Professor Cedillo Lopez or uh, Senator Cedillo Lopez, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and continue. We can hear you great. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard I, I was hearing some music, and I okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, so the Violence Against Women Act is a really important act because it's the source of funding for agencies like mine, um, or like Enlace Comunitario was. It provides a lot of the funding and training. Um, it provides training for um, uh, uh, district attorneys from around the country, U.S. attorneys. It provides training in, for agencies. It, it provides... Um, uh, it provides money to help with a lot of the indigenous, it, or at least the new one had money, um, and in large part because of Deb Holland, for training to deal with uh, native um, missing, and, uh, missing and murdered women. It also um, had, a, it's, it's a very broad act. And the sad thing about not reauthorizing it is because it holds up increases that we need and this particular act had jurisdictional issues, dealing with the jurisdictional problems on, on native lands. And so every time they fail to reauthorize it is more and more time that we fail to address critical women, critical issues facing women. So I'm, I was very disappointed that they didn't reauthorize it the last time. And I'm very hopeful with the new composition of the Senate that, we, that it will go through. And it is an act that has grown in importance over time since its first, first reauthorization or first initiation. Um, I wonder why it, co it constantly needs to be reauthorized. And so I wanna look into why do we always have to come back to the table and, and, and keep doing it every couple of years. So that's my understanding of it. Thank you very much, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Now we're gonna go to Georgine Lewis. Thank you. Um, so the Violence Against Women Act is really set to address um, 
women that are suffering in uh, domestic relationships and women that are um, victims of, of, of violence. And this is especially important because it affects women of color. So again, Native Americans, Hispanics, Latinas, um, Blacks. So this is something that is extremely important because without it, the programs that it supports, which includes um, help and training and counseling, um, these services aren't being offered to the women that are suffering. And, and sometimes the suffering is so quiet and inside, especially when it's a domestic issue, that women then don't get the help that they need, or they don't realize that they're victims uh, because it's, it's a family setting. So the education is important, the support programs are important, and we really need to take care of these women that um, are, are, are victims, unfortunately, and, and reauthorization is extremely important. It's helping on every single level, the local levels, um, and also um, the levels with uh, the tribal communities. So again, because violence affects women of color more often than, um, than others, you know, it's extremely important, especially in our diverse state of our beautiful um, land of enchantment, that we need to ensure that um, we don't have to educate people about missing and murdered indigenous women, that this is something that's known, but then also that there's something, um, some resources available for people to seek help because we need to help our sisters. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine Lewis. Now we go to Randy McGinn. Deb, thank, thanks for this question. This is something that's, that's near and dear to my heart because I started off 40 years ago as a violent crimes prosecutor I'm prosecuting cases of domestic violence and violence against women and rapes. And in fact, with the, the wonderful curandera, Elena Avilas formed the very first rape crisis center here in Albuquerque. And rape and sexual violence um, affects women in such horrible, horrible ways. Um, and over and over again with the people that I work with, I, I saw women who who could never go out again, who became housebound after they got raped. Um, other women who were raped at 2.30 in the morning when someone woke them up in their bed and for the rest of their life, every night of their life woke up at 2.30 in the morning again because of the trauma of the rape. And even with counseling, they suffer and it, 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 the tentacles of all, of all that suffering go out. And so, so this is something we have to do. And the, the Violence Against Women Act is long overdue. Um, it protects, it provides resources to for rape cases and to do things like test these backlogged rape kits um, um, for, for stalking and for domestic violence. And the thing that I think is very important that they've put back in the bill that they took out before is that they say if, if a man is convicted of a misdemeanor domestic violence, which is usually where these cases go, they can take his guns away. And that, that will save lives. That will save lives because often when the day a, a woman leaves a man, that's the day that she's most likely to, be, to suffer violence and he'll come over and try to shoot her. And so that has to stay in the bill, um, even though the right is screaming about it, that has to stay in the bill to prevent the kind of thing that we saw down here where this guy could go in and buy a gun in one day, but a woman couldn't have an abortion without getting, going through all these hoops in one day. You know, that that's, we've got to stop that and stop the easy access to guns where so many women are killed by men who get mad, go buy a gun and go shoot them like that happened in Atlanta. Thanks, Brian, done, I got it. I'm, I'm getting the two minutes down, thanks though. Thank you, Randy McGinn. And now we go to Victor Reyes. You know, this question hits close to home. I saw my mother face abuse in our own home and we were lucky enough to have a supportive family structure that could help us in those difficult moments but I think about my sister, I think about all of the women out there and the support that they need to be able to address moments of violence. And one of the reasons that I have been such a strong advocate for gun violence prevention measures is because I know that the presence of a firearm in an instance of domestic violence increases the likelihood of a homicide. And the Violence Against Women Act directly addresses this intimate partner homicide. 
by closing the stalker loophole, closing the boyfriend loophole, making sure that we are clear about the fact that those should, the individuals who should not have a gun cannot have access to it. It provides the resources for women who don't have the support that they need to gain access to housing, to transportation, to anything else so that they can escape a dangerous situation that they may find themselves in. It protects and helps native women, women of color, ensure that they have the resources they need to escape these situations. You know, we need to make sure that we are fighting to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. And it's the stories of, of women like my mother that need to be at the forefront of that conversation when we change it and make sure that we are holding the Senate accountable for reauthorizing this legislation. But we also need to be clear about passing legislation to look after missing and murdered indigenous women and addressing domestic violence in every single route, providing the support and the care structure that we need for our communities. No woman should have to endure what my mother went through. My sisters should not live in a generation where that is a possibility. And that begins by reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act and making it a long-term foundational legislation that we look to that is instilled within statute forever. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Reyes. And now we go to Melanie Stansbury. Thank you, um, State Auditor. You know, every nine seconds in the United States, a woman becomes a victim of violence in her home. That means the vast majority of women in our country are facing violence within their home or by a partner. The Violence Against Women Act was authorized in 1994 by then Senator Biden was a champion in the United States Senate, now our president, because we needed tools to address systemic violence that affected women across all sectors of our society, to be able to provide prosecution, restitution, to ensure that there were tools and resources available to women. And in 2013, I can tell you that one of my proudest moments as a civil servant when I was working in the White House Office of Management and Budget is that I got to sit in the auditorium and watch President Obama sign the last reauthorization of VAWA. And he did it at the Department of Interior because the last version of VAWA, which this version contains, included critical, critical support for tribal communities and particularly women in tribal communities who are facing violence. It's one of the reasons why I have been a huge champion of addressing the issues around missing and murdered indigenous women as one of the co-sponsors of the task force here in New Mexico that has been doing this work in partnership with tribal leaders and communities across the state. We have the highest rates of missing and murdered indigenous women in the country. We have to address this issue. It's about safety. We have to stop the partisan wrangling that is happening around gun violence and around transgender rights in particular over this bill. And we have to pass HR 1620, which is the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act that passed the House five days ago. So we have to advance this legislation and I will champion it in Congress. Thank you, Melanie Stansbury. Now we're going to go to Patricia Robo Caballero. Gracias, estimado. So this hits close to home for me. Uh, several years ago, uh, when I was embarking on my hire to complete my two masters, I worked part time. I was recruited to work part time, part -time with the Catholic Charities, who was the um, office charged with um, the being the resource to help victims of, of um, that were under VAWA, protected under VAWA. And it was very difficult, not for me, but it was difficult uh, to be able to understand why we were having a tremendous amount of lack of resources. There, were, there was very few funding. I was only able to help on a part-time basis when there was a huge load. There were no attorneys, one attorney full-time to help the entire state of New Mexico the entire state of New Mexico. And the other thing that I found out, and I always espouse to this premise that the victims are not always subject to domestic violence. These are women that are subjected to victim, as victims of sex trafficking, of, um, of all types of violations. And they were difficult to talk 
about. And I was speaking Spanish, so I had to handle a lot of the Spanish uh, clients. And they were embarrassed because of cultural, uh, in, cultural issues and other types of issues and very embarrassed to talk about what they were being subjected to. But had I not been there to help them walk through and document <clears throat> their particular circumstances, I would never have known that it wasn't just due to domestic violence. They were being subject to these horrific actions. And one of the things that I found out in my most recent research is that this particular version of the house version does not include those protections and measures to help deter sex trafficking and other child um, uh, uh, related issues and violations and especially to child mar marriages. Thank so you very I will do much. that. Thank you. Patricia Roybal Caballero, thank you. Now we go to Francisco Fernandez. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Deb. Uh, two women come to mind when you had brought up the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, the first time I think I had really discussed this was with a friend of mine from high school. I could have been maybe more than 17 walking through the mall. Uh, she had seen a woman pushing a, a carriage with a baby and started crying. <clears throat> and she had told me that that she had been the victim of, of rape and had to have an abortion. It hit in a way that I hadn't expected to. I think at that age, we're just not used to hearing those kinds of discussions um, from our friends in high school. The other was from my mother who was sexually assaulted by her stepdad um, when she was a teenager. And she still copes with that through the, to this day. What I appreciate about this act is that it finally provides more funding for culturally specific services, um, which is important for people of color, right? We know that not all education or in programs that are, are targeted towards us work because they're not culturally sensitive. Um, as folks mentioned that there is more uh, tribal jurisdiction, which we also know is, is gonna certainly uplift those who have been victims of domestic violence or, or, or sexual assault on tribal lands. Um, one thing that I do wish that it had, <clears throat> excuse me, taken into account was, was immigrants. Uh, this particular act does not take into account immigrants. And when I think about the sheer number of women who have been sexually assaulted while being um, illegally detained, to put it, to put it simply, uh, for just trying to seek a better life. Those folks don't have a voice in this bill. It's important that they do. Um, one thing that I do appreciate about it, at least from my understanding, is that this bill also does not discriminate based on gender. So that's great for folks in our transgender communities, uh, people who consider themselves non-binary or cisgender, because at the end of the day, there are many folks who are victims or, or survivors of this type of behavior. Um, that includes men. So even though it is the Violence Against Women's Act, it does take into account and specifically says that it, these protections are allowed or, or provided to everybody regardless of their gender. Um, that's important to, and I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Fernandez. And now we're gonna go to our next question. Remember folks that are out there, about 120 people, Make sure you share this right now. You're here in the future of the 1st Congressional District right now tonight, thanks to the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. Question number three is going to be brought to you by another great woman who leads in the state of New Mexico with the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. She is the president of the Valencia County, my home county, Valencia County Federation of Democratic Women. I'm going to ask her to turn on her camera. I'm going to ask her to unmute. I'm going to ask her to deliver question number three, President Lorraine Espinosa. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. It's great to see you tonight and thank you for helping us present this tonight. Uh, I also want to thank all the candidates for running for, for CD1. Uh, my question is Child Care for Working Families Act. Across the country, too many families are struggling with finding and affording high quality early learning and care that will help their children thrive. The cost of child Child care has increased by 25% in the past decade, forcing many parents to choose between paying for child care, leaving workforce altogether. The Child Care for Working Families Act would address the current early learning and care crisis. Please share your knowledge about the act and what efforts you would make in support of this if elected to Congress. Thank you, Madam President, Lorraine Espinosa. And this question, number three, we're gonna start with Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Thank you, Brian. 
Um, I'm so happy that you're asking this question. And Lorraine, congratulations on being the, the president. I, I don't know if you knew, I was a founding member of the, of the Valencia County Federation of Democratic Women. So it's great to see you in that, in that role. But the Child, Care for Thank you. Families, the Child Care for Working Families Act is really important because this is what, what I mentioned at the very beginning. When we were talking about the barriers that hold women and particularly women of color down is not having sufficient child care resources. So a lot of women end up having to quit work or take part-time jobs or when they're working two jobs, having um, in, ineffective and, and uh, sometimes dangerous situations for their children and mainly because they have no other choice. So this is a really important, um, important um, act. And I'm very, very proud that the legislature recently was able to pass the one and a half percent, the amendment, the constitutional amendment, which by the way, everybody vote for this um, because it's gonna be on the ballot. And that is to take one and a half percent more out of our land grant permanent fund and direct it to early childhood ed education and to um, education, did higher education as well. And all those are the kinds of things that we need to keep doing in order to provide adequate childcare for our working families. Um, and not just some childcare, but quality health, quality childcare, so that that'll make a difference for them when they, when they enter school, so that they're ready for school. Um, and the, the Child Care for Working Families Act is a combination of tax credit and funding. And that's what a lot of, of New Mexico, a lot of New Mexicans benefit from is the funding. Our state um, is in dire need of this kind of funding. And so I am going to be a huge champion for this for women. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And now we go to Georgine Lewis. Georgine Lewis is gonna unmute and take it away. Sorry, thank you about that. Um, or thank you for the question, sorry about that. Um, so this is actually really important to our families here in New Mexico. You know, fortunately when um, I had my daughter, I had my mom to take care of her during the day while I continued to go to high school and, and even during undergrad. Um, so that was really important that I didn't have to worry about paying for the extreme high cost of a child care, but also the safety and well-being of my daughter. I think that's really important. So with the, and I think this act serves that purpose to ensure that um, women with children are able to succeed, um, especially, you know, low to moderate income families uh, with kids that, ha or excuse me, with families that have, um, multiple kids too, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to pay for childcare. So it helps in that um, childcare regard and, and putting kids in, in safe caregiving environments, but also for um, the Head Start programs, which are extremely important to ensure that kids do receive um, early education intervention to help. And I too am so glad we uh, passed House Joint Resolution House, House Joint Resolution One, and I do encourage everyone to please, please vote for that. That's extremely important, and that's another tool that's going to help um, the kids in our communities, our families in our communities. Um, so, so these are really again to ensure success of our our working moms and our families that are out there every single day um, trying to provide uh, food for their kids, shelter, um, ensure that they have um, access to medical care. So um, these programs, again, are extremely important for our families. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine Lewis. Now we go to Randy McGinn. Thanks, Brian. Lorraine, thank you for the question. It reminds me of when I was um, working my way through school as a waitress at Chelsea Street Pub. And it's, they didn't even have the $2.13 sub minimum wage then, you just worked for tips. And I remember on a slow night coming to the end of the evening and finding one of my fellow waitresses in the bathroom weeping because it had been so slow that she had only made $10 more than what it was gonna cost her for childcare. 
I mean, it was just horrible. She had to go home and give all of her money to her, her, to her babysitter so she could go out and then had $10 for food for her family for the day. And so it's all of a piece. And, and, and luckily in the, in the American Rescue Plan, there's a great provision for the child tax credit that's going to start providing $350 to people with kids under, under six. And that's, that's one piece of it to try to help raise people out of poverty. And I think it's supposed to raise between 45 and 50% of people across the nation out of poverty. But here in New Mexico, it's gonna be higher because we have such child poverty. But, but the, the Child Care Act for Working Families is the second piece that it only works with this piece coming in too, so that there is good child care provided to mom so they can actually go to work if they don't have the support system of a grandmother or a mother to watch their kids. And the pandemic, I think there's opportunity in crisis We've seen how broken the system is in the pandemic for all these women who had to leave the workforce and go home because there wasn't any good childcare. And I think we have an opportunity to finally get this passed. I think, it's, I think, think we've, we can get there because people now understand how difficult it is um, when, when, you, when you have no childcare and you can't go to work. So I think we've got a good chance at it this time. Thank you, Randy McGinn. <laughs> and now we go to Victor Reyes. I'll never forget the feelings and the tears that I heard on the phone when there were individuals who would call the governor's office and talk to us about the fact that they were frontline workers. They were people who needed to go into work to make sure that we could continue, that our communities can continue to run, but they, but they couldn't because they couldn't afford childcare and there was no one else to help look after their kids or educate their kids during this pandemic. I think the fight for universal child care is the, one of the key economic justice fights that we are looking to face. That's why I'm so proud of the work that I did at the state level to help establish the early childhood and care department, making sure that we're creating the early childhood trust fund, providing new revenues and looking for every single dollar that we could provide to make sure that we were recruiting and retaining high quality child care, uh, child care professionals, early childhood professionals into our state. You know, we need to make sure that we are passing legislation to provide for this universal child care at the federal level. We set the line in the sand here in New Mexico, but we need help from the federal government to make sure that we are addressing the issue of child care deserts in our state. There is such a lack of access in so many communities in this district, in the state, and that means that we need to set up the networks to make sure that that is a reality. We need to make sure that we are making the investments in recruiting and retaining high quality child care professionals that currently we are missing in our state. We need to make sure that we are supporting the work of current child care professionals in the work that they do. And we also need to make sure that when we are looking at this and we are having a conversation about this, the child care should be free for most and affordable for absolutely everyone. That is a premise that we must not lose ground on and something that I'm going to hold strong on in Congress and make sure we get across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Reyes. And now we go to Melanie Stansbury. Thank you so much for this question, Lorraine and um, State Auditor. You know, this is a social justice issue. It's an economic justice issue, ec justice issue, and it's an economic issue. What we know based on some of the statistics that Dorothy read earlier is that this pandemic has had an undue impact on working women. And in fact, the largest loss to our economy was working women because they had to stay home and care for their children and attend to their education. So we know that when we invest in early childhood care and education, that it raises up women, it diversifies and grows our economy and it's critical to the well being of our children. And I want to just take a moment. A number of people have um, called tonight out the passing of HJR1, which um, Representative Mo Maestas, in particular, and Representative um, Javier Martinez have championed for years for a decade, in fact. And for any of you that didn't get to watch the debate that Representative Maestas did two nights ago on the House floor for concurrence, it was one of the most brilliant debates that I've seen on why we have to invest in our children. It's critical to their own well-being, to their educational outcomes, to their social and emotional outcomes. Because when we invest in children at an early age, we know that they will become thriving adults and that we set them on a course for every success 
success. When we invest in childcare, we know that women are able to work and to lead and to be a part of the economy. And we know that when we invest in childcare, our economy is able to grow and thrive. So these are all of the reasons why we have to pass this bill, the Child Care for Working Families Act. And it's why I personally and so many across our state have worked to pass HJR1 and just so many thanks to all of the incredible people who helped to make this possible. So thanks. Thank you, Melanie Stansbury. Now we go to Patricia Roybal Caballero. Thank you, Estimado. Again, speaking from my own personal experiences, I operated um, in-home childcare facilities for over 20 years. And they were designed to deliver daycare, childcare services uh, for subsidized. So the state helped subsidize and they were based on income. And it really helped uh, the low uh, income working poor that were women and particularly working in um, a, a depressed neighborhood, a poor neighborhood that had no other way to hold on to their little two or three jobs at minimum wage and then provide childcare. But what was great about what we did was that we created a partnership with community colleges in order to certify the in-home daycare providers so that we were doing two th pathways, creating several pathways. One, creating childcare subsidy to help working poor families, but at the same time, we were helping women become entrepreneurs, owners of their own child development facilities. The Child Care for Working Families Act gives us a perfect opportunity because the federal government and the state governments can now act in partnership to create these same types of partnerships and networks to be able to strengthen our families. And it also allows us to create partnerships with our community colleges here and uh, technolo technological um, services to provide job training and also career paths. Uh, it does, it gives us tremendous opportunities to be able to do a whole lot. And I think the incentives for the state is that not only do the federal and state act in partnership, but the federal government is creating incentives for the states to get into these programs. And New Mexico being the poorest state in the nation with having the highest number of uh, poor educational attainment, huge educational gaps, and then with the majority of our women working, single women of color, this is a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Roybal Caballero. Now we go to Francisco Fernandez. Thank you so much, Lorraine, and thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, so growing up uh, with a single mom who was a cashier at Walmart, we were able to be taken care of because as some folks have heard, it takes a village. Um, I was passed between one grandmother on, on some days and another grandmother on others. And what was interesting is both of my grandmothers took us to work in order to care for us. Um, with 20% of women in New Mexico living in poverty, it's imperative that something like this be made into law. I could only imagine what it would have been like to have been able to uh, get a head start on my education or be able to make sure that my mom didn't have to stress about who was gonna watch us and when. Um, from my understanding, the bill does provide funding through grants to the state so that they can go ahead and grow child care services uh, for pre-K so that way children can be attended to and well cared for. What I appreciate about this bill is that it also opens up the doors for the economy. If we were able to provide every child with, uh, with, with, with care uh, and development prior to attending kindergarten and going into school, that creates so many jobs for other folks to become uh, uh, preschool teachers, for those who are working in the medical field to help uh, help with, with um, children with disabilities who would also be serviced through this bill. And it's important that we note that because it certainly helps women get out of poverty. Not only does it help women get out of poverty, but it does, as I mentioned, help children get the education that they need. As we see in New Mexico, education seems to be something that is lagging. And if we start early on, then I think we can certainly confront that and make sure that we overcome any obstacle in regards to education or the well-being of our children. Um, additionally, while we always talk about women, I think it's also important to note there are a lot of single fathers out there who are also trying to do their best, and this works for them, as well as for caretakers who are taking care of children, uh, much like my mom did. She adopted our three, my three cousins, our three nephews after their mother passed away. So I look forward to seeing how this program moves forward. More importantly, I hope that it clears the Senate, because as we've seen too often, the Senate seems to put up too many barriers when it comes to programs like this that really have the ability to uplift our children and it should uplift our children. Thank you. 
Thank you, Francisco Fernandez. Now we go to Celinda Guerrero. Thank you so much for this question. Um, as I understand the act, it's going to build off of the existing um, ch child care uh, assistance programs that um, are already in place and expand them by 13 times um, the access, but it also puts it in state's control to be able to help manage those resources. And I was somebody who benefited from early childhood. I went to Mariposa uh, Preschool on Mountain Road in Martinez Town when I was young, and I, I recognize and understand the importance. I know that it helped me um, when my mom was working 40 and 50 hours a week at Kmart on a Trisco. So, uh, I recognize that, and I also am a mother of six who has had to navigate these um, systems and structures. So the thing I appreciate about this bill is the investment in the caregiving economy, because that is where we really have to invest. As somebody who has had to seek out quality care for my children, especially when I was working odd um, jobs that were had odd hours in the evenings or weekends, early mornings, it was really hard to find child care that was quality that I could trust. And so our investment in the caregiving economy will boost access for everybody. And so now that we are receiving this investment to the state, we have to be thoughtful about the way that we're making these investments in New Mexico and the way we're building out this uh, caregiving economy and also to provide access across all of the spectrum. The other thing that has to be easier that the state will have control over now is for us to be able to have an easier process for applying for these services and, the, and this assistance. Oftentimes I had to take off of work and I miss a whole day's work sitting at the child care services office trying to get uh, renew my um, child care assistance. And so that is another barrier that's in place that we have control over fixing. And so being close to the issues, we know how to solve these problems. Those closest to the problem have the best solutions. We know how to navigate these structures. And that's why I would be able to help navigate this. Thank you, Celinda Guerrero. And now we move to our fourth question. We've got two questions left for you folks. And then the dynamic closing remarks from each of these eight awesome candidates for CD1 to fill the vacancy created by our incredible leader, Deb Holland, now Secretary of Interior. And let me just say, as we look to this fourth question, we're gonna to talk to a great leader who's gonna deliver it. Somebody who really helped me build my own personal democratic values. And by her side, I can't look her in the eye without having my heart grow thinking of her and her partner uh, who led in democratic values, Francis Ray, who we miss so very much. But I'm gonna to bring to you now the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, the regional director for the entire first congressional district. She is amazing, you're gonna love her. How about you take it away, Marisa Dio? And Marie, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and take it away. There you are, you're on the air live. Thank you, Brian. I, I could call you honorable sweetheart, but we're online, so I better not. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be a part of this. I'd like to thank the candidates for being here, all of you, for your time, for your sacrifice, for your work. Uh, it's a big job to take on, and we appreciate it. My question statement is to for you to please tell us your involvement with the Democratic Party of New Mexico on a county and local and state level and what are the some of the grassroots efforts that you have been involved in yourself to promote the party platform and New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. All right. Thank you, Madam Regional Director, the incredible Marie Cedillo. And this question, we got a big thumbs up. We're going to start out with this question number four, going to Georgine Lewis. Thank you. I was trying to set my timer last time, and now I'm just, so just shoot me a hand. But I, I think that's extremely important. And Unfortunately, with the legislature, we are not paid. We haven't been a professionalized legislator. You know, legislature. So it, it's really hard because representation matters, but without having our legislature paid, it really limits 
the amount of people that can afford to take off from work for 30 days or 60 days, and then the interim committees. So this is extremely important that um, we note. And throughout my years uh, in the legislature, you know, it's a tough balance. It's a tough balance trying to be a lawyer, a single income, and 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 really ensure that those um, that, that, that we meet the needs of our constituents. But um, also at the same time, you know, my involvement includes um, encouraging and mentoring women to run for office. I've been trying to get Native Americans excited about running for office, um, especially in, in paid positions, but at every level because representation matters. Um, so my involvement has been mostly within my community. I have town halls, I go to the neighborhood association meetings. Um, I try to register people to vote and learn about the issues. And um, I hope that when they see me, when they see you know, a semi-young woman that's a Native American participating in the process that usually shuts doors on us, or uh, makes it difficult for us to attend. These are things that we need to be involved in. And so um, I'm super fortunate that my constituents um, have had my back. They are um, working with me for National Night Out, um, for other things within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine Lewis. And now we're gonna go to Randy McGinn. Thanks, Brian. Um, Marie, thank you for the question. You know, I've been involved in democratic politics all my life, but I have a gap in my resume. And the gap um, is a 12 year gap when my husband in the love of my life was on the Supreme Court. And the ethical rules for Supreme Court justices say that they can't be involved in party politics, nor can their spouses, which I always thought was sort of anti-feminist. And so as soon as he got on the bench, I went up there to find out what I could do and what I couldn't do. And they said, you, you can't even sign somebody's petition because if the appeal comes up to him, they're gonna to have to recuse off his case. So even when my friends would bring me petitions to run for office, I'd say, you have to pick, do you want my signature or do you want my husband on your appeal for, for the election challenge? And they always picked, they wanted my husband on the appeal because he was a great Supreme Court justice. Um, and so, so before that, let me tell you before that 12 year gap, um, I did lots and lots for the Democratic Party. I was always there for election protection at the union, at the union halls, you know, whenever elections were on to protect the vote. I was involved in lawsuits involving redistricting and also this big lawsuit that we had about 10 years ago where they tried to, it was longer than 10 because it was before Charlie was on the court where they were trying to restrict voting rights. And, and I was part of the team that proved there was no voter fraud in the state of New Mexico. And so we didn't get this put in 13, 14 years ago because of that defense. And, and I will say, because I understand you've lost the love of your life too. Um, after my husband died, there was a year that I wasn't involved because I was recovering from that. But, but I have gotten re-involved and been involved in party politics ever since, and in, including calling into Georgia to make sure that Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff won and being involved in those kinds of turning out the vote efforts. And so, so the, the, the one thing is, is that now I'm back involved. Thanks, Brian. And, and so thanks for the question, but that's thanks. And thanks for letting me explain the 12 year gap that they wouldn't let me do stuff in. So very Thank frustrating. Thank you, Randy McGinn. Yep. Thank you so much. And then now we go to Victor Reyes. Victor. I'm proud to be part of a party who advocates to protect our air, land, and water for workers' rights, for women's reproductive rights. And I've been at the front lines of making sure that who we elect, recognizing that who we elect matters. When I was the legislative and political director of Conservation Voters New Mexico, in addition to defeating the, all of the anti-environmental legislation in the 2015 legislative session, I also helped protect incumbent legislators who were standing in support of our air, land, and water in the state legislature and led them through their largest election cycle to date. As the, as the campaigns director for Progress Now New Mexico, I worked with the coalition of women, family, and community members to relaunch the Respect New Mexico Women campaign and that helped to defeat the, the, the 1969 abortion ban that was on our books this year. But we also worked to make sure that we were standing up for progressive candidates and causes and making sure that they had the tools necessary to stand strong and hold the lines to protect workers' rights, making sure that our educators had a voice in every single hall of power. I'm very proud to help help elect 
the first Democratic Latina governor in this country with Michelle Lujan Grisham, who has helped make sure that we have been able to endure this pandemic and bring about some of the most monumental change in our state. And I was proud to serve as her deputy campaign manager, as her um, as her uh, assistant transition director and as her legislative director, helping her pass the key legislation across the finish line. At the local level, I've been engaged with groups like the, uh, the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, stalwarts like Pam Cordova, Beverly Michaels, so many great women making sure that we are standing strong against individuals who are perpetrating a rhetoric of gun violence, perpetrating a rhetoric that is anti-community, anti-women, and I'm proud to have stood along with them. I'm proud to serve as a precinct chair. I'm proud to have served as a previously as a member of the state central committee, and I'm proud to represent the values that we hold as Democrats each and every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Reyes. And now we'll go to Melanie Stansbury. Thank you, Auditor. Okay, I love this question because I live for organizing and working with people in the party and our precincts at the grassroots level. So I have worked at both the local, the national, and at the state level. And I wanna just tell you all a little bit about how we flipped House District 28 in the Northeast Heights, which had never had a Democrat or a woman represent it until 2018 when we flipped this seat for the first time ever. And people told me this seat could never be won. Even on the day of the election, people were saying, ah, you know, that seat will never flip. And we won this seat by seven points in 2018, and we held it by 10 points this election cycle. And the way that we did that is that we recruited, trained, empowered, and gave tools to people across our community, all ages, all different parts of the community, and said to our community leaders, we want you to be a part of this movement. We want you to be a part of this campaign. We want you to help us transform the Northeast Heights. And you know what? We did. And the way you do that is by inspiring people, by living your values. That's why our campaign is hiring local. We employ local people. We are the only unionized campaign in this race. It's why we're building the Democratic Party. We're working with Flora and others across the district to recruit talent in our precincts and wards and getting people involved and excited about the process. And that is how we are going to win this race. We're going to win in the fall in the mayoral race and it's how we're going to win up and down the ballot in 2022 and that's why we want to work with all of you to ensure that we get all of these amazing democratic candidates elected so thank you thank you melanie stansbury and now we'll go to patricia Roybo caballero thank you and this is a great question because i've seen many of you dynamic women many of the years uh as we've crossed paths in uh, our democratic work. I, I'm a grassroots organizer. So as a grassroots organizer, I start from the premise of working at the base. And so my work has been over 50 years as a um, voter registration uh, activist, a voter participation. I've worked with uh, increasing the voter turnout with Spanish speaking uh, voters, teaching them how to use the systems, how to um, vote. Uh, very simply. And more importantly, my mother was a precinct chair for over 25 years and a party activist. So it was embedded in us, as well as the um, principles and values that my father brought to us as a military veteran. I think that it's important to note that I'm the co-chair of the Hispanic Caucus within the Democratic Party of New Mexico. I co-chair with Ben Salazar. In the past four election cycles, we've increased the Hispanic voter turnout in increasingly so that it's made a difference in our uh, democratic elections. I also wanna mention that uh, I've served, I, I'm a precinct chair, I've been SEC, I've been the county parliamentarian, I've been the state parliamentarian. There's not, I've been on the rules committee, the resolutions committee, the platform committee. I've done every single aspect, I've served every single aspect of the democratic party because it's important to me for our platform to reflect our constituencies, but it's even more important as a state representative, as an elective, for me to represent the party platform. And that's why taking the time and effort as a volunteer 
to participate in all these processes is so very important because this is what representative and participatory democracy is all about. Thank you, Patricia Roybal Caballero. And now we go to Francisco Fernandez. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Marie, for the question. Um, it's a little bit challenging for me. So my, my background and my profession is in television production, which tends to take me to multiple states. Um, I've worked in Georgia, Louisiana, and California. Now, the good news is that regardless of where I am, I, I'm always supporting our democratic ideals and, and our party. Uh, when I was in New Orleans and we had the devastating blow for Al Gore's loss, that was my first real wake up call. I was 18 at the time. So that involved getting organized with the Democrats at Loyola University where I was at at the time. I, same thing when I was in Georgia, I happened to be attending a graduate school there at a historically black college. And it was imperative, especially uh, at that time to really get folks involved. Um, one of the ways that we would do that in this information age is by sharing links amongst each other to make sure that people knew how to determine who their local representative was. Um, a lot of times we found that people had miseducation or misinterpretations on who to go to for what they wanted resolved in their communities. So it was imperative that we shared with them that information, build grassroots organizations. Um, in Los Angeles, it was something similar, although there's much more of a, of, a, of a huge union, I guess, union drive over there to get folks involved with the Democratic Party, which is great. I myself am not a union member. I'm not allowed to join the union given my position, but it is certainly something that I've been a part of in terms of growing the party. Um, more recently, since returning to New Mexico uh, during the pandemic, it has been getting the folks involved here at the, the uh, grassroots level and really the inner workings of our party. Uh, a lot of folks, including folks like my grandmother, who's turning 88 years old, she's been a lifetime Democrat, and she'd never even heard what a ward is until I ran for Congress. And so it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to teach folks like that, like my grandmother, who, who as I mentioned, the diehard Democrat, this process, um, not just folks like her, but my mom, my dad, my, my plenty of cousins. And I love that they are uh, becoming enamored even more with the party. They're looking forward to growing it even more. Thank you so much, Francisco Fernandez. And now we go to Celinda Guerrero. Thank you so much. Yes, my involvement with the party. I've done all of the things and all of the ways. Um, I have been a voter registration agent for over 10 years, I'm registering voters in low propensity districts and, and places like the Albuquerque Mosque. Um, I have organized efforts uh, for campaigns um, to mobilize voters. We have, I ran the 2019 uh, right to vote bill here in New Mexico that would have ended disenfranchisement here. I was an SEC member in the previous um, election and this one again. I gave a speech um, two years ago at the last, at the last um, Democratic Party primary here in Bernalillo County. And the thing that I was addressing, and I, I am a truth teller here in this space, and the thing I was addressing is how little people look like me that were in that room. There weren't the working poor there. There weren't black people. There weren't, we, there was a handful of us. And so I wanna, I, all my work in the party has been to show and to, and to bring to these spaces people who look like me and the engagement that needs to happen. We have much work to do. We still have much work to do, even in these conditions. And this past seven weeks that we've been able to mobilize people in um, precinct chairs and ward chairs that have been ignored for a very long time, where we live in neighborhoods where nobody talks to us from the party, but we are mobilizing. And this is the unity that we have to bring. We have to encourage and bring our folks with us um, all the time. And we have to help our folks um, bridge those gaps and build the network. That's how we've been successful, is by building a network of solidarity and learning and engagement that has helped us all come along together and be strong and powerful in these spaces. And that's what organizing in community and in the grassroots looks like. I have also done work in rural communities um, in Doniana County and in McKinley County where we have um, engaged low propensity voters and turned out 97% when we did. Thank you, Celinda Guerrero. <laughs> now you. we're gonna go over to Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And she is gonna unmute and take it away.
Are you back? Am I back? You're good to go. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know what happened. Well, you know, my father taught us when I was a child that the Democrats are for the people and Republicans are for the money. And I have been active with the party since I was a child. Um, Marie, thank you for the question because I think it was you and your sister that recruited me to the Bernalillo, Federa the, the, the Bernalillo Federation of Democratic Women. So thank you for that. And I've been involved with uh, fashion shows and attending events for, for I can't even remember when, when we started. Um, and I was, as I said before, a founding member of the, of the Valencia County Federation of Democratic Women um, when Pamela Cordova started that. And I also um, was a state director for Clinton Gore back way back when, that's how long I've been involved with the party. I've been a precinct chair. I remember inviting 250 people in my precinct to my house for coffee and donuts and about 30 people showed up and I was disappointed. But when I told the ward chair that, he was thrilled. Because of that, he wanted me to become the ward chair next time. And I, this is how I became vice chair of my ward. Um, I said, this was my campaign speech, please, please do not elect me ward chair because I'm writing a book. That's when I was writing Family Law in New Mexico. And I said, I cannot be ward chair. I don't have the time. That's how I became vice ward chair, <laughs> vice chair. Um, I think uh, party activism is so important. I, if you read our platform, it is very important to, to see that it represents my father's values. It's all about the people, not the money. And if we stick to those values, we will win. So thank you for the question, Marie. It's so good to, to see you. I can't hardly wait to see you in person again. Thank you, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And now we go to our fifth and final question. And look, this is a great time to have this forum hosted by the Bernalillo County Federation of Democratic Women and the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, uh, because this is Women's History Month. And you can't talk about Women's History Month in New Mexico if you're not talking about the Honorable Clara Padilla Andrews. She was a trailblazer in politics, philanthropy, and is an entrepreneur in New Mexico in publications and communications. So during this Women's History Month, we celebrate the president of the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, Clara Padilla Andrews, former Secretary of State of the Land of Enchantment de Tierra del Encanto. Take it away, Clara. Thank you so much, Brian. I am just so amazed and so excited about the uh, group of candidates that we have. You are just amazing. You have just inspired me. Um, my question is uh, on the, the, this past week, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and others held a press conference on the potential of for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. The House adopted a resolution to remove the deadline for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. It passed the House and now goes to the Senate. Now, last year, we celebrated 100 years since women uh, gained the right to vote. It's only been 100 years. We've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. In your two minutes, give, me, give us your opinion and position in ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment and how you support it. Thank you, Madam Former Secretary of State of New Mexico and the current president of the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. This fifth and final question will begin with Randy McGinn. Lada, thank you for this question. You know, I, I always say, how is it that we don't have an Equal Rights Amendment already? It just, it just seems inconceivable that it couldn't have been passed already. And, um, you know, as, as someone who um, was the first woman in, in a lot of rooms. So when I was in high school, they didn't have a girls um, uh, a tennis team. So I had to fight my way onto the boys team. I had to fight my way into the press press box as a, the first woman when I was a sports reporter that had to, was the first woman in the courtroom. Um, I've spent my time, when you say, what are we gonna do? Because I was the only person who looked like me in many of these spaces and was the first person to kick open the door or break the glass ceiling, I spent my time reaching back and pulling other women through the door. I mean, one of the things that we can do is to, is to pull them through and to give opportunities to them. And it's one of the reasons why I was one of the original founders with Juliana Kub of Emerge New Mexico to recruit, train, and encourage women to run for office. 
Um, and so the things that we do in our personal life, you know, and one of the great things is that there's so many people running for this seat that came through the Emerge program. Um, and so it's actually worked. And so we have to get this passed. Um, I think we're gonna get pushed back from the other side, but we can't let that stop us. We have to show that government can work for the people again and work for women again. And so if it takes getting rid of the filibuster to get this passed, I think we have to get it passed. And then we have to have um, all, of course they have to vote. All the states have to vote again and we have to lobby for it, organize and make sure that women turn out to vote to finally pass what should have been passed years and years and years ago. Um, and, you know, and, and message about it because it's not a radical idea, it's just the right idea. So thanks. Thank you, Clara, for the question. Thank you, Randy McGinn. And now we'll go to Victor Reyes. We absolutely need to pass and ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. That is key to making sure that discrimination, whether it is whether it is in the workplace where women continue to make 83 cents on the dollar for every dollar earned by a man, or whether it is in any sphere of engagement, that women are not discriminated upon and the key legal protections are in place to make sure that this never happens again. And I'm committed as a member of Congress to making sure that we do everything in our power making sure that we are getting the ratification and the votes in states. I will campaign wherever we need to, to make sure that we are promoting this amendment, that we are being clear about the necessity to have these legal protections and the ramifications that it has on reproductive justice and freedom, the ramifications that it has, what it means for fighting for equal pay for equal work, when it comes to making sure that we don't have discrimination for transgender women, women of color, women in every sector of the workplace. This has to be a priority and I commit to any resources and time to making sure that it becomes a reality. All right, Victor, yielding another minute back to the field. Thank you very much, Victor Reyes. Now we'll go to Melanie Stansberry. Thank you, State Auditor, and thank you, Clara, for this question. You know, this last year, because of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that my great grandmother was the first woman in the United States history that was able to vote in my family. That's four generations ago. And there's no question that we've made incredible strides over the last several decades. You know, I think about my grandmother and my mother, who was one of the first women to enter the workforce in the field that she worked in, and now myself serving as a state legislator. But I think it's remarkable to think that neither the word woman or sex still appear in our constitution because it wasn't part of the fundamental framework, right? When our constitution was passed. So it's high time that we pass the constitutional amendment which guarantees the rights to equal access and uh, equal rights for women. Um, that affirms that sex discrimination is inconsistent with the core values of our country, that helps to dismantle discriminatory laws that still exist in states across the country, and that ensures that there's gender equity across the entire United States. So yes, we have to get the ERA across the finish line. I will champion it. And in addition to that, we also have to champion women's leadership, voting rights across every community in the United States and make sure that not only do women have equal protection under the law, but that they are able to vote, that they are able to lead and that they are able to take our next generation into the future and that we leave a ladder down behind us. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie Stansbury. And now we'll go to Patricia Roybo Caballero. Gracias. You know, um, I have to tell you, I was raised by women, women in my family. I was raised all, all uh, mother and aunts, and then they had all daughters, so all cousins. And then I was raised by the sisters of Loretto, all women at a time in the 60s when the sisters of Loretto the most progressive, uh, the more most progressive nuns in the nation and in the world, were fighting so that they could remove their habits and use lay clothing so that they could live and work amongst the people as equals. This was important for us. It was a per important example because we were raised as strong women and we were raised to respect equality, equity fairness and justice. I had the 
honor of marching in the 1970s when we fought for, against Roe versus Wade and when we had a multitude of marches to, to uh, pass the Equal Rights Amendment. It's been on the burner for far too long. It's about time, as we've been all saying, women are already taking the lead. Women are already demonstrating leadership. Women are already looked at in terms of being able to uh, create change. We have not been afforded it legally. And I think that that is incredibly important. And I think we owe a lot to our trailblazers. I wanna acknowledge Justice Ginsburg, who was a principal uh, trailblazer and honored. Uh, Dolores Huerta, who I marched with, who's been my mentor all my life. Uh, we've never, never uh, believed in discrimination of any kind. And it is beyond the time to afford equal play for equal work. Women's rights are human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Roybal Caballero. And now we're gonna to go to Francisco Fernandez. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Clara. Well, two things. Um, first of all, it's ridiculous that it's taken this long and we still haven't passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it, it shouldn't even have to exist, quite frank, but we know how this country was built and it wasn't necessarily built for women or people of color at the end of the day. So we fight on, we champion on. Um, the great thing about the ERA is that it will certainly help close many of, of the gaps that exist in, in our institutions, um, not just with women, but women of color uh, we look at hospitals, for instance, where Black and Latinx women end up waiting in the ER from 30 to 40 minutes longer than white women. We looked at, or how we talked about earlier with the gender gap. Uh, all of these things need to be addressed and more. It is going to be extremely challenging, though, because we do need that two, three, uh, two thirds, excuse me, uh, vote to have that happen. That's going to mean that we're going to have to do campaigning like hell. We're going to have to remove the filibuster, and I'm pretty pretty sure that the people will thank us when we pass the legislation that we need to pass by removing the filibuster. If I'm not mistaken, Virginia was the last state to, or the most recent state to, to ratify this. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I think that means that we certainly have to ensure that the For the People Act is, is passed in the Senate so that we can ensure that folks are able to vote. That means getting more uh, women and, and supporters of the ERA elected to office so that way we can push this forward Amending the Constitution, as we all know, is not easy. So for me, it certainly means engagement, engagement, engagement. That means with the folks who are just learning this process for the first time, all the way to the folks who are uh, downright just know this process for like, like the back of their hand. I am confident that together we can pull this off. It's just going to mean that it's going to take a lot of dedication and education so that we can close this gap together. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Fernandez. And now we'll go to Celinda Guerrero. Yes, thank you so much. This is so, so critically important. As somebody who has had to navigate a Title VII claim on um, discrimination because of sex and gender inequality, somebody who has had to navigate a lawsuit against a powerful um, in employer um, on the basis of sex, and um, wage discrimination, I fully understand why this is so important because it's very difficult when you're in that process to prove, you have to prove to the courts that it's because of your gender and this is not acceptable. So it, it, uh, it makes all of the other laws even harder to, to, um, to navigate. And so the ERA is so important because it will, it will help to enforce in the courts a constitutional right for us to be able to stand um, in our rights in the courts so that we don't end up in litigation that, um, that helps to uh, um, turn back um, all that we have advanced for women's rights um, through the legal process. Um, and the Congress has the power to be able to make this so. We have to push and we have to be persistent to make sure that this happens. Many of the current legal protections against sex discrimination can be removed um, by a single marginal vote. And so there's a lot of courts at every level who are having to deal with this. So by passing the ERA, we become stronger and we enforce um, what women need for us to be able to navigate these difficult situations and have the legal standing um, to be able to, to win in these court proceedings and to set case law that backs us all, that advances all of us. Um, because we know it has, like you said, it's just been a hundred years. We have so much more work to do 
And this is a critical key issue for us who have had to navigate litigation on these kinds of issues. Thank you, Celinda Guerrero. And now we're gonna to go to Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Clara, I want to lift your leadership up. I want to congratulate you on the book that you that the Federation uh, wrote and um, did last year that was so incredible, honoring 100 women. I wanted to share with you, that's how I found out that Saya Correa Hemphill and I may be related because we're both related to someone that was honored in that book, um, our relative, um, 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 Warren Otero, what was her, Nina Warren Otero. I wanted to say Adelina and that is her name, Nina Warren Otero. Um, and that's, we were both related. And then I also wanted to lift you up your leadership in starting the first Native American Federation group, the Laguna Federation of Democratic Women. I am so proud of you for, for getting that done. Um, you're, you're so amazing. But of course, ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment is important and removing the barrier was a first step in getting that done. But you know, the states that haven't ratified it, are, we know those states, um, they are the red states. So they're going to be, um, it's gonna be, um, as Fernando said, or Francisco said, I called you Fernando because your name's Francisco Fernandez. As Francis and I can hardly wait to meet you in person, Francisco. Um, uh, so as, as he said, this is about, we're gonna have to really teach and educate the public about how important this amendment is gonna be for equal rights. We won't be using an intermediate standard um, in dealing with equal rights. We will look, be looking at a at strict scrutiny of legislation that affects women. And it's also going to be a very powerful statement to all legislators to ensure that women's rights are at the forefront. So yes, I'm. we have to do it. And I will be an absolute champion of change in the constitution, which is hard, but removing the, removing the timeline um, was a very important first step. So thank you for that question and thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And now we go to Georgine Lewis. Thank you. It's only been a hundred years since women have had the opportunity to vote and Native Americans have finally obtained that right to vote decades later. I'm so proud of our team, campaign team member, Cindy Nava. She hosted an excellent Facebook session in happy tears because she knows how important it is for people to vote. I love when folks talk about how early they were involved in the system of going to the polls and being engaged. That was not me. For a long time, my family and other tribal members didn't believe that voting matters because those doors were closed to us. We saw what happened in Arizona and how the tribes voted blue. That was so amazing. Barriers are made for communities of color where if we pass and ratify um, equal rights amendment, we'll have equal rights and access for people regardless of color, of class or background. These are all things that need to occur because representation matters. I would love to see a culture of voting in these communities that are always discriminated against, where they feel confident that their voices will be heard. This is such an important issue. And I've been extremely blessed to have students that I've taught at UNM help me with my campaigns. And they helped because I would always tell them, underrepresented people need to hold seats in leadership. Again, <laughs> representation matters. We need to be at these seats where decisions are being made, where these conversations are ongoing about these policies that are affect our families and our communities. And before closing, I just wanna thank the Federation for this important discussion and for asking about all of these critical issues. Congratulations to the Laguna Federation of Women. I, that's so exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Georgine Lewis. And now we've come to this very exciting part of the night when we get ready to do closings. Before we have those closings, and then I'll uh, let the Honorable Clara Padilla Andrews close, but I, I wanna just say that what a privilege it has been for me uh, to be in the presence of such phenomenal, phenomenal leaders. Uh, I have a pre-existing relationship with, with all of you. Uh, I've spoken to all of you. I respect all of you a great deal. 
And, and I'll just say that it's particularly powerful for me during this Women's History Month, during a time, uh, a week that followed pain for my family, as my wife is of Asian descent uh, for women in America, and particularly uh, as it relates to violence uh, for people of color, it's been a very traumatic, traumatic and trying time. And so to be asked to stand with the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women and the Bernalillo County Federation of Democratic Women to join you tonight and facilitate this conversation, uh, it's something that I won't forget. And I also want to say thank you to these eight tremendous candidates, because while I have hosted many forums, there have been very few that I can think of where the candidates were so very disciplined about landing their answer right at two minutes. So I appreciate you very much. You've made it so easy to moderate tonight. Thank you to the federations that hosted this, Bernalillo County and our state federation. And we're gonna go in reverse order for our closing remarks, folks. Uh, I will say that if you check out my Facebook cover photo, if you've loved these two minute answers and you're gonna love these two minute closings, each and every one of these candidates are gonna join me for an hour on Cafecito con Colón. For the next eight days at 9 a.m. on this very same Facebook page, you'll be able to see each one of these candidates individually from 9 to 10 a.m. on Cafecito con Colón. Thanks to all these candidates for saying yes. They said yes, and I'll show up whenever the schedule permits, and they were there. So I wanna say thank you to them. The Honorable Clara Padi Andrews asked me to tell you that between now and the 30th is when you get to know these candidates. If you're on the State Central Committee, you get a vote in deciding who's going to be on the ballot on June 1st to determine who will be the individual that follows the incredible historic service of our now Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland. So with that, let's get to closing remarks, folks. Thank you for joining. We've still got about 100 folks there, about 75 shares of this, over 250 comments. People are engaged. They loved you all. And we're going to start in reverse order from opening. So that means we'll be with the Honorable Representative Melanie Stansbury. Melanie, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, State Auditor Colon, and to the amazing New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women, to everyone who tuned in tonight, to my amazing team, to my family. I want to say I am so grateful and honored to be able to be a candidate in this race. I grew up right here in Albuquerque, and I know the strength and the resilience and the heart of our, of our community. And I know that when we put our hearts and our minds together, our community thrives. As your next Congresswoman, I will fight to address hunger, homelessness, water insecurity, access to healthcare, broadband, social and economic and racial justice, and my number one priority will be to tackle the biggest, most important issue of our time, which is global climate change. I will fight for New Mexicans. I will fight for the dignity and the needs of our people and our communities. The moment we are living in in history demands not just that we have a good representative, but that we bring fundamental change to Washington, that we create and imagine an entirely different political system, one that is more just, more equitable, and more resilient. And to do so, we have to elect and mobilize and organize all across our community. We have to hold this seat. We have to elect someone who will fight and stand with our people and roll up their sleeves and get to work. Because at the end of the day, it's up to all of us. And that's why it's critical that we elect somebody who understands New Mexico, who understands and grew up right here in our community, who knows the struggles of our communities, who knows the system in Washington, who knows the science, and somebody who will stand with our community every day and organize, not only to get themselves elected, but all of our Democrats up and down the ballot. And that is why I am running to be your next Congresswoman. That is how I will stand with you, how I will fight with you, how I will love with you, and how I will represent our community if I am able to serve as your next Congresswoman. Thank you for this wonderful night. Thank you for hosting. It's been a pleasure, and I am so incredibly grateful Thank to be here tonight. Thank you, Representative Melanie Stansbury. And now we go to community and civil <laughs> servant, Mr. Victor Reyes. Victor, take it away. 
Gracias, Brian, y gracias la Federación por la oportunidad de estar aquí en esta noche. You know, we didn't get asked directly about reproductive freedom and justice, but I've been thinking all of, all of this night, regardless, about the story of my friend, an individual who served our country in the Marine Corps, put her life on the line, but when it came time for her, where she made the decision to terminate her pregnancy to seek abortion care, she was forced to go to a predatory lender to receive the funding necessary to pay for her abortion. Let's think about that. Someone who put their life on the line, risked their life for our country overseas, and yet we required that she go to a predatory lender where she was required to pay over 100% interest rate to receive the funding that she needed to receive a healthcare procedure. This is a reality and it shows the inequities that continue to exist within the federal government, inequities that need to change. We need to repeal the discriminatory Hyde Amendment that prevents women from accessing abortion care. We need to make sure that we pass universal child care, that we are being clear about passing the Paycheck Fairness Act. But to get that done, we need to make sure that we are electing a change maker who has proven that they can shake things up and get things done. And let me tell you that nowhere needs shaking up more than our Congress. And we can continue to elect you know, traditional candidates and expect different results, or we can choose to choose non-traditional candidates who have the ability to make lasting change, to be bold, to swing for the fences. And so tonight, I'm asking you to swing for the fences with me, to believe in a bolder tomorrow, to believe in not just building back better, but building back bolder. We can receive the transformational change. We can pass Medicare for all. We can pass the Green New Deal. We can repeal the Hyde Amendment. But we need to do that by being bold. And I'm here today asking you to be bold with me. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Reyes. And now we go to trailblazing extraordinaire attorney, Randy McGinn. Thank you, Brian. And, 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 and thank you, ladies, for this wonderful evening. We have such an extraordinary bounty of riches in our candidates, don't we? Um, and this has been just a wonderful evening with people um, talking about great bold ideas. We're, we're so much better than Republicans is what I think whenever we have one of these forums. Um, and, and so I have nothing bad to say against any, any of the people in this race, but I, I will answer the question that I get asked over and over again. All of you are progressive. What are your, what's your skill set that makes you different from the other people in the race? And so let me tell you that there are two ways to social justice that are going on right now in Congress. One is to pass laws that enact social justice. And quite frankly, the legislative part of this is the easiest part that any of us could do. Someone gives you a, a, a bill, you sponsor it. The hard part of that is persuading other people to go along with this and to build coalitions to make sure that our, our legislation and all of our bold, bold progressive ideas that Victor talks about are actually passed. And that's where I have a special skill set from having taken on the baddest corporations in the country and having to negotiate transformative deals, not just asking for money, but asking for changes to make the community safer. And then there's the second piece of getting equity and transforming government. And that's the accountability piece that's also going on in Congress, where we're investigating all these people, these white men who are hanging on by their, by their fingernails, who, who invaded the Capitol so that we can hold them accountable and say, this is not okay. And those hearings will start in probably three, three to six months. And the one person who knows how to hold people accountable, who knows how to cross-examine liars, and let me tell you, there's plenty on the other side, that's my skill set. And I'd like to go to Congress to do that piece, to fight and to hold people accountable and expose the lying and the disinformation that's gone on for the last four years um, and stand up as a country and say, this is not okay and we're gonna go forward and transform the government to work for people and not corporations ever again. I'd appreciate your vote for Congress. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Randy McGinn. And now we go to the Honorable Representative Georgie Lewis. Thank you, Mr. State Auditor. Thank you, New Mexico Demo Federation of Democratic Women. Thank you to everyone out there watching. I'm so glad you're involved and you're interested. That's really important. Um, again, representation matters. I have been a lawyer now for 15 years. I've stayed in New Mexico to help the communities that I care about. 
Our tribal communities, our tribal people are important. I'm a legislator that um, even as a freshman had the trust of our speaker to be appointed as vice chair of the House Judiciary of, as, and House Parliamentarian. Um, now, you know, we've, we've seen great work with, with what happened in our legislature, including passing the New Mexico Civil Rights Act. This will ensure that people are treated equally under the law, regardless of color, class, and background. So tribes throughout this great state and nationally are ready to step up and help us win this election to ensure that it stays blue. We have some great volunteers. Folks came out this morning to deliver oven bread so we can have a breaking bread session with Georgine Lewis for New Mexico. Um, these were some people that weren't involved in politics before they saw, you know, our campaign getting involved. Um, I've, I've been in the legislature for nine years. I want to serve my community. I'll do that in Congress. We need someone with experience. Unfortunately, we suffered through a failed experience with our Trump administration. We need someone ready on day one. In addition to that, we need someone that's gonna be there long-term to hold this seat for many, many years and ensure that we have advanced placements in committees so that we can deliver for New Mexico, we can deliver for our communities, and um, I, I am ready to go. And I just wanna thank everyone again. More information can be found at our website, georgine4nm.com. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Georgine Lewis. Now we go to the Honorable Senadora Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. Ryan, you have a calling and, and, and it's beyond politics. That is amazing. I want to thank the Federation and uh, both the Federation of Bernalillo and the, the New Mexico Federation and all of the leadership there. Uh, my name is Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. I grew up in New Mexico and I raised my three children here. I've always been involved and in, here in the district. I've always been engaged and involved in my community. And I am running a campaign that is different. It's free from fossil fuels money, free from corporate PAC money, and of course, no NRA money. I'm, only, I'm one of the two legislators that released my fundraising report in the middle of session, well before it is due. The other major unique thing about me is I am, a, I am a Latina law professor, and I would join law professors in Congress like Jamie Raskin and Katie Porter, in the legislature like Elizabeth Warren, and even then Senator Barack Obama had a law professor background. That is unique, and I want to join those extraordinary individuals. We have engaged hundreds of people in our 40 workshops that Amanda and Tiffany have left. So we have brought tons of people into involved, to being involved in the party. And I have shown that I can hit the ground running. I was appointed to the state Senate the day before it started. And literally I had to hit the ground run, running on day one. And I was able to do that. I have brought forth progressive legislation and I have been effective in passing progressive legislation. Um, I've brought legislation that shines the light on a huge industry like the oil and gas industry. And I have shown, and I've stood up to them and shown that I can do so and that I don't back down. I am ready and I ask for your support. To learn more about me, go to um, cedillolopez.com and you'll learn about at least dozens of my issues. So I really appreciate this opportunity to, to be here and to spend this time with, with this extraordinary group of candidates. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Senator Antoinette Cedillo Lopez. And now we go to community organizer and advocate extraordinaire, Celinda Guerrero. Thank you so much, Brian. Way to roll those R's. I love it. <laughs> we are powerful warriors out here. We are Guerreros. I am here as the working core and an organizer for Black Lives. I have never been a political candidate before, but I was inspired to run because of the new wave of uh, Congress members who are people of color, queer, and the working class. I am a queer BIPOC feminist and am the working poor. As an organizer, we know that we must center those that are at the center of impact because we know 
that those closest to the problem have the best solutions. This is a great opportunity for us to bring those voices to the decision-making table. New Mexico has never sent a Black person, much less a Black queer woman, to Congress. We must keep moving forward after the historical election that sent Representative Deborah Holland as the first Indigenous woman elected. We can continue to make history and advance representation for us all. We know diversity is important when promoting democracy. It will take all of our ideas, experience, and background to continue to re-envision the building of the world that we all want to live in and where we are all valued and we all truly matter. I have been a community organizer since I was 17 years old, and I have used grassroots organizing tactics to uplift and invest, building power within our own communities. It is time now that we channel that same grassroots organizing power and people power and take it to Congress. That is why I see my run for office as our run, our run for the people. We are the working poor. I'm a union member, I'm a human rights activist, and I am a dedicated voter registration agent, poll worker for more than a decade. I'm a movement builder who moves with my people. I will move with, my, with you as, as your next Congresswoman. We are powerful when we move together to pass legislation to advance the priorities of us all. There are a lot of lawyers in corporate class representation in Congress, but democracy works when all of our voices are represented. I am a community healer and my values are to lead with love and stand in my courage. That will hold me accountable as your next Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you, Celinda Guerrero. And now we go to television and film expert entrepreneur, Mr. Francisco Fernandez. Thank you, State Auditor Colon, and all of the members of the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women for tonight's forum. I mean, it truly is an honor to participate with such a diverse group of candidates. It is clear we are light years, I mean light years ahead of the GOP. Um, as Democrats, I think it's fair to say that our differences don't lie on where we stand on the issues, but rather how and why we'll champion legislation like universal health care, a $15 minimum wage, a greener and more just economy that supports people and our planet. You see, I champion those issues because my community and I continue to live them. I know what it's like to struggle in a low wage job and unemployment benefits. I've had plenty of unjust racially charged encounters with police, yet I've never feared for my life. And that's a privilege black Americans don't have. Living with HIV for the 13, for 13 years now, I've been at odds with a healthcare system that puts profits above people. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. As the only candidate coming from the, uh, from the private sector, I do understand that there are concerns. After all, I'm not an elected official or a lawyer, but I wanna remind everyone why that's a good thing. First of all, I owe no favors to anyone, whether they be a politician, a business owner, a corporation. The people can trust I will always put them first because in the words of activist Fred Hampton, I am the people. Secondly, the constitution clearly states three qualifications for being elected to Congress. They must be at least 25 years old, a citizen of the US and inhabit the state in which they'll be chosen. That's important to remember because you see the founders wanted the house to be the legislative chamber closest to the people, not the chamber closest to the lawyers and political establishment. Given that lawyers and self-proclaimed politicians comprise 75% of the House, that may be one reason that so little seems to get done and it's gotta change. I believe government should be only limited by our imaginations and the dedication of those we elect. And I'm dedicated with one hell of an imagination. Despite our challenging times, I know our brightest days lie ahead. With my voice in Congress, together we will rebuild a greener, healthier, more equitable land of enchantment where no one is left behind. Once again, my name is Francisco Fernandez. I am the candidate de Corazon. I invite you to learn more about me and where I stand on the issues by visiting francisco4nm.com. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Francisco Fernandez. And now we come to the Honorable Representative Patricia Roybal Caballero. Take it away. Gracias, estimado, y gracias a todas mis compañeras. I've lived social justice working in the hard labor world, and I've lived the civil rights movement. I've marched with Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, making necessary trouble. I don't just use social justice as keywords or titles or labels or because it's political trend. I've worked in the agricultural fields as a UFW organizer. I worked in a chemical plant as a United Steel worker. I worked in the Department of Welfare as an AFSCME organizer, as a high school special education teacher, and now at the university, I'm a member of the AFT Teachers Union and Graduate Students Union. 
And I've lived the life of a community organizer, living in poor underserved neighborhoods, joining my neighbors, getting dilapidated and rat infested tenements torn down and replaced. I joined my neighbors fighting for streetlights for safety, closed trash bins to avoid spillage, to remove contaminated water coming from drinking faucets and to equip schools in poor neighborhoods with the same texts and libraries as schools in rich neighborhoods. And I've lived the life of a dark woman of color facing racism and questions of citizenship. As a daughter of the US military attache in Honduras, I was even denied entrance to this embassy because I looked like a Honduran citizen and couldn't possibly be a US citizen. And at eight months pregnant, I was detained at the airport because I looked like an undocumented Mexican. And as a state legislator entering a local Santa Fe restaurant for a meeting, I was told by the host that they weren't taking applications that day. The plights of our hard workers, our poor and racialized communities, of our students and teachers have all been experiences I've lived. I don't have to script, use taglines, or talk about these as issues because they've been the life I've lived. These experiences of income inequality, climate action, and racial justice drive my state legislative priorities today and will be the necessary policy priorities I will continue in Congress. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Adelante y si se puede. Thank you, Representative Patricia Roybal Caballero. And let me just say, we've got so many great folks that have tuned in tonight, so many great giants in New Mexico history when it comes to women's history, people like Mary Molina Mescal. I saw Margaret Garcia out there. These are all trailblazing women who've made a difference in New Mexico's political landscape. And folks, one of these eight individuals are gonna make a difference in New Mexico political landscape right here in Congressional District 1. They've got nine days to earn the vote of the State Central Committee members. And then on June 1st, the public will determine who will fill the shoes of and follow the incredible Secretary of Interior, Deborah A. Holland, uh, our former Congress member. So uh, thank you again. I'm going to take this time and I'm going to turn it right back over to that trailblazing leader, our former Secretary of State of the Land of Enchantment, the Tierra del Encanto, the 47 star on the beautiful flag of the United States of America. Gracias a todos por venir y... Honorable Clara Padilla Andrews, Madam Presidente. Brian, you are just amazing. I knew the day that I called you. You know, one thing about Brian, uh, he always, always gives you a direct answer right away. And I called him and I said, we're going, we wanted to uh, organize this forum. And he said, I'll be there, I'll help you. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. My board, you know, the executive board, let me just mention their names. Uh, because they also thank you. Beverly Michaels is our vice president. Luella Harden is our secretary. Diane Murphy Griffins is our treasurer. Marie Cedillo is our regional director for CD1. And Lydia Piro is a regional director for CD2. Dr. Leanne Salazar Montoya is our regional director for CD3. And Pam Cordova is our immediate past president. These women are amazing. They, we work together very well throughout the year. And uh, one of the things about the New Mexico Federation of Democratic, we, we do a lot of things in between, but three of our major events that we have are, we have our uh, uh, Women in Blue Legislative Day during the legislative session where we usually have a few um, um, things that we do there while we're there. And uh, then we have our spring meeting and our fall meeting. And all of the, the, this past year, all of them have been on Zoom, but they've been well attended also. But uh, so on behalf of the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women and the Bernalillo County Federation of Democratic Women also, I thank you. I thank you the CD1 candidates for taking the time to be with us this evening. We expect it to be two hours, but we're a little bit over. But that's okay because all of you were so interested. It was so good to hear every one of your responses. I also want to again thank our uh, our incredible, honorable Brian Colon for always being willing to help. Thank you so much, Brian. And then also for our panelists, Marisa Dio, Deb Dodson, and uh, Lorraine Espinosa. Uh, the la, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was uh, Cedillo Lopez that we had uh, our first. Pueblo, uh, and that was the Laguna Pueblo Federation of Democratic Women. So we're very encouraged about 
the women that work with us throughout the state. Uh, so I know you're running here in Bernalillo County, part of Sandoval and part of, uh, of uh, uh, Valencia County and part of Torrance County. But when you travel throughout the state, I always look up our Federation of Democratic Women. They're always willing to help you. And of course, most of you know that we do not endorse in the primary and we consider the state central committee as your, as your primary right now, because this is an unusual year for all of us. But uh, be, be, know that once the primary is over, once you get the one that gets elected from the state central committee, we'll be there, we'll roll up our sleeves and help you all the way, so know that. And um, also, uh, I would like to uh, thank again, thank each and every one of you for, for putting your name out there because, you know, running for office is not an easy task. Uh, it's not an easy task for yourselves. It's not an easy task for your family. I know I've been there. And, uh, but, you know, for some reason, I, I guess I've lived the Democratic Party all my life because I've been involved since I was a kid, you know, and it's just been a very, very interesting process. And I get to meet so many wonderful people but again, thank you so much for putting your name out there. You all are incredible. Whoever gets chosen will make an excellent, excellent United States representative for CD1. So again, gracias y Dios que los bendiga a todos. Thank you so much, Madam President of the New Mexico Federation of Democratic Women. Thanks for hosting this with the Bernalillo County Federation of Democratic Women. Thanks to all these great candidates. You're all on the air so people can see those million dollar smiles that you've got. Because let me tell you, for the last two hours and 25 minutes, they've seen your hearts. They've seen your capacity to lead and inspire. And I can tell you, I, for one, am inspired by each of you. I can't wait to host you each at 9 a.m. over the course of the next eight days on Cafecito Con Colón. So tune in if you couldn't get enough of these folks tonight. Come back <laughs> tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock right here. Thank you to our federations and thank you to this amazing field of candidates. My name is Brian Colón, your humble servant and state auditor of New Mexico. It's been 810 days of awesome. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks, everyone. Be safe. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Stay safe. Good night.